Hello and uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, from we're going to change uh, topics beginning in this lecture. We're going to move towards calculus. So we've been studying about functions. We saw some couple of simple examples of functions, straight lines, quadratics, and maybe a few more examples like polynomials and all that. And then we looked at uh, systems of linear equations and how to solve them. And this is a new topic we are starting, uh, which is limits and derivatives. It's the first step into what is called uh, popularly as calculus. Okay. Once again, we'll take a very applied problem solving view. We won't be very uh, rigorous and careful in our definitions. The idea is to learn the tools of calculus so that we can solve circuits and other applications. So that's the main goal. So let's get started. So what are the problems and questions that calculus tries to address? What, what are the problems uh, that need uh, notions of limits, notions of derivatives? as we'll see later notions of integration and all that. Let's, let's ask those questions first and try to understand those questions and their importance. So if you recall, when we looked at functions, there were three basic tasks which uh, I said uh, you should become comfortable with when you look at any function. Any function that you look at, there are three tasks you should be comfortable with. First is you should be able to evaluate it. Given a particular x, you should be able to evaluate the value of f of x. Now, there are lots of computational tools that can do this for you, but sometimes it's good to know how the computational tool is working. Like, how is it that the computational tool is evaluating? So, simple question, simple functions like the straight line, right, ax plus b, or even the quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c, or even a polynomial, we are able to easily evaluate. It's just multiplication, addition, we can do that. Or maybe even if there is some rational division going on, we can evaluate, uh, even so those things we can evaluate. But uh, if there is a slightly more complicated function, we have to rely on a calculator. And how is the calculator working? How is it that the calculator is able to calculate the value, right? So that's an important question to ask and we will ask that uh, beginning in this lecture. So once you're able to compute, you can try to plot. Now here also there is a slight subtlety. I will talk about it in the next, uh, next uh, slide as the next problem that we look at. Uh, finally, we also looked at the <coughs> problem of inversion, right? So this, I didn't call it quite invert, but basically what you're doing is you're, you're given a y naught and then you have to find the x naught such that f of x naught is y naught. So what value of x results in a particular value for the function? It's sort of like the inverse. Given x naught, you find f of x naught. That's one way. But given f of x naught, find x naught, right? So that's the invert problem. So that's uh, there's three things you should be able to do with the function. So let me ask some interesting questions about the computation now. So the evaluation of the function. If you look at a function like x power 1 by 2 or x power 2 by 3 or 10 power x, these are functions that uh, you're able to plot, you're able to calculate, right? So if you take Desmos or any other tool or a calculator, it can calculate these functions values for you. How is it that it's calculating that? Like for instance, a very simple question. How do you compute the value of square root of 2? We all know some 1.414, I mean, where does it come from? How do you calculate, right? So the reason why I'm pointing out root 2 is root 2 is a very typical, simple example. But you may have more complicated one, fifth root of 7, right? I don't know, 190th root of 2000, you know, I mean, you, you can have any number of problems like that. But how do you calculate those numbers? Your calculator is able to calculate it. How is it working? So we should know that. I think it's, it's an important thing to know. And uh, that's, that's, that's the first thing. So even calculation for a slightly more non-trivial function, how to do is a very important question. So 10 power x, for instance, how do you find 10 power root 2, right? How do you compute the value of that? I mean, of course, calculator can do it, but how is the calculator work, okay? So this is something, uh, it's an important problem. And uh, we will look at, uh, look at how, so in, in a way, uh, the philosophy behind how this is done, uh, maybe not the most, uh, easy procedures we will look at, but still uh, we will motivate as to how these computations are done. Okay, so this is the uh, first problem, and we don't know the solution to it yet, right? So we don't know how to how to solve this problem. Easy function evaluations we can do. How do you do such complicated function evaluations? So this this is uh, an important point where calculus and limits and all that enter the picture. Okay, the next is plotting and this notion of continuity of a function. So here is a function x and f of x and let's say I have used something and I've calculated the value of the function in many points and I've plotted them here, right? So this is like one point. So at this particular value of x, f of x is this, 
at this particular value of x, f of x is this, I have done all this plotting. So, once I get these points, how do I make this f of x versus x curve, right? How do I make that curve, right? So, if most, if you ask most people, most people will say, draw a smooth continuous line connecting all these points. You might do that, right? So, I have done that here. So, you can draw, maybe this line is not as smooth as it should be. It's just my own freehand drawing. So, you can draw a different line if you like. And uh, you can draw a smooth continuous line connecting these dots. But why is that justified? Why is it that this function, see, I have evaluated it at these blue points. I really don't know what is the value here, but I am sort of saying it has to be something like this. It has to be like a smooth continuous curve. Why, 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 why do, why, why, why is that, why is that justified? Why is that a reasonable thing in most cases? Uh, why is a smooth curve something reasonable that you can expect? So that's an important question to answer. And what exactly is this smooth? What do I mean by smooth? It's, it's a very physical sort of term. We have not precisely quantified it uh, mathematically, okay. So, this is also a problem. So, the first problem dealt with evaluating the function at a particular point. The next problem is this plotting. You seem to be making one continuity assumption here, the smoothness assumption here. What are these things? What is the notion of smooth? What is the notion of continuity? Okay, we have not looked at these things. We have not defined these properly. Once again, limits and derivatives and calculus enter the picture here. They are very, very important for this purpose. Okay. The third motivational problem is about growth and fall and min and max of a function. So this has huge number of applications and uh, in, in all over science and engineering, right? So whenever you have a function function f of x versus x, so this could be, you know, um, inside some device, you may be uh, watching for some output and the input might be some, you know, some variation you do. Like for instance, if you have a, a radio, you are increasing the volume, right? So, there is some knob you are changing here, that is your input. So, when you increase the that angle of that knob, the volume is increasing. When you decrease it, it is decreasing. So, you have the function, which is uh, the output volume, right? That is a function of the setting here in the dial and when you increase the dial, this is increasing, right? So, so this, this kind of a behavior you can imagine is happens everywhere, right? You go to a big factory, there is all sorts of dials going on and uh, <coughs> you know, there is a physical system which responds to these dials, right? You change this dial, you can imagine an aircraft or something, you're flying, you change this, change that, push this, it, it moves, it does different things. You increase something, this changes, decrease something, that changes. So, the world of science and engineering is governed by understanding increase and decrease of functions f of x versus x. You, you really have a very good handle on when I increase x, is f of x going to increase? When I increase x, is f of x going to decrease? Okay. These are very, very important. And where does the maximum occur? Okay. What are the critical things about this function? So, supposing I show you a function like this, where is your eye drawn? Which are the points that you think are significant in this function? How do I understand this better? Okay. So, all of these things are connected to growth, fall, min, max. And all in all of these things, limits and derivatives play a very, very vital role. So, let us uh, first look at uh, uh, this question that I asked you. When, when, when I show you this function, your eyes probably are not automatically drawn towards these points, uh, which I marked in red here. What is so nice about these points? What is so critical about these points? These points, you could call them as critical points. So, you can see at these critical points, this function seems to be hitting a peak or a trough. Trough is like the opposite of the peak. That's that's what it is. And it also changes its behavior around such points. What do we mean by changing its behavior? This growth and fall behavior changes around these points. So, to the left of x1, for x less than x1, okay, I am using this kind of notation for the first time here, so to understand that, if you have x less than x1, the function is increasing, right? So, if, if x is for x to the left of x1, if I increase x, f of x is also increasing. It, it has, you know, this kind of behavior. So, so it, it's going up like this. So, when I increase x, f of x is also increasing. But if I go to x1 to x2, right, x between x1 to x2 here, if I increase x, f of x is falling, okay. So, it's decreasing. Again, after this critical point x2, you see that behavior switches. See, around the critical point x1, the behavior switched. For x less than x1, it was increasing. 
After that, it fell, started falling. After the second critical point x2, it is again beginning to increase. So, you see x2 to x3, if x is between x2 and x3, if I increase x, if I increase x, move towards the right, my f of x is also increasing. Okay. Again, I hit a critical point x3 and after the critical point, the behavior reverses. And then I hit a critical point x4 and after the critical point, behavior reverses. Okay. So, you see here the critical points of a function, which you have to understand. So, if, if, if you are modeling some uh, science experiment, there is some output you are measuring, you think it is a function of some input, you are measuring these things and then you sketch this, you are really paying attention to where does it peak, you know, where is it increasing, is it decreasing. So, those things determine a lot of things about what you can do to achieve a desired output, isn't it? So, it is very, very important to understand this behavior and uh, critical points play a vital role in any function you should be able to find the critical point. Okay. Now, uh, and once you have the critical point, there is this notion of uh, increase, decrease going on, growth and fall of the function around the critical point. And you see around the critical point, behavior changes. There is yet another property of this function which is related to asymptotics. What is asymptotics? Whenever you say asymptotic, it means what happens for very large value of x. Okay. So, you notice here, when x becomes very large and positive, this function seems to be tending to some non-zero value. I mean, it seems to be flattening out, right? So, it is going to non-zero. On the other hand, it looks like I have not fully drawn yet, but it looks like if, if you go towards large negative x, the function may go off to zero, okay? So, these things are sometimes important. The fact that, uh, you know, what happens to the system when the input becomes very large on the positive side or very large on the negative side. It is like, for instance, you know, you may you may suddenly experience a huge input which you don't want, you know, some external force may do that lightning, this, that, whatever, I mean, God knows where these things come from. So, you, you may get that and in that case, what is going to happen to your system? Is it going to blow up? Is it going to, you know, go off to infinity or is it still going to be some finite value? These are important for you, right? So, these are all crucial, crucial things you have to study and limits and derivatives play a very, very important role in understanding these kind of behavior. In fact, this uh, we, we will see other situations where uh, there are functions which may, which may go off to infinity at some finite value of x also. It may happen. We will see those kind of functions also. So, all those things uh, we need to understand. Now, couple of things I want to briefly mention about the solutions to these problems. So, all of these three problems, right? What are the three problems? Let me remind you. Evaluating non-trivial functions. How is it done? Plotting functions, connecting points, why is it continuity is important, what is the smoothness, why are we doing that and finally, understanding the critical points, growth, fall, asymptotics of a function, where does the function blow up, where does the function go to zero, all these kind of things. Now, one can argue that I can do this experimentally, graphically and all that, right. So, it is okay, it is fine. Once I give you the graph of the function, maybe you can, you know, see it, but I have always pointed out how relying on graphical methods is a problem, right. Sometimes the scale may not be okay, you may not be able to measure everywhere, you may not be able to draw everywhere, you will not get accurate exact results if you want very good accuracy in your system. So, a lot of systems need precise accuracy, you know, in control. So, if you want all that, it is not possible. So, analytically being able to do this, given an analytical specification for f of x, maybe f of x equals some complicated function of x, right? Being able to do these things analytically is also very, very, very important. So, limits and derivatives are very vital for helping you solve uh, these three problems and we go, so as we go on to the rest of the lectures, uh, you will see how to solve each of these problems. We will come back to these problems and comment on them at the end of the, of these sets of lectures, but uh, let us jump into limits and derivatives and try and understand how these kind of problems are solved.